Give me hope. I hope I'm not too late. Lord, just give me you. Everything else can wait. Just give me you. I hope I'm not too late. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love. Amen. Praise God. You know, we thank you, Sir Newton. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to welcome all of you aboard. Amen. On our young adult store on the subject, Mary's license is not a receipt, but a commitment. Marriage license is not a receipt, but a commitment. Um, I'm waiting that when we are done with this subject, then we'll have an open forum for you know, uh, great discussions, amen, that all of you um, will bring your questions uh, for us to, to um, go through them, amen, because I'm liking this very, very important um, subject, amen, because we live in an age and a time that people have very short feet, so that, that God deems as sacred and very important is usually trivialized or um, its import and impact is minimized by our own ways of doing things. So we talked about, you know, we treated a lot of uh, topics under this, amen. We started by examining what this actually mean, marriage license is not a receipt, it's a commitment. And then we look at it, marriage is serious business. And we discuss it, marriage is greater than companionship or cohabitation, you know, which most people now has become the trend of the day that most people prefer to live together and not get married. <clears throat> Sometimes with the, you know, fear that when we get married, you know, it, it will not, the relationship will not survive. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. But tonight we are going to look at marriage requires sacrifice. Marriage requires sacrifice. Uh, please let me say here that anything that is of great value in life, is worth sacrificing for. Anything of immense value in life is worth sacrificing for. You and I are together today because our mother and our our mothers and our fathers they sacrifice. When I see my mother's photo, my mother is ninety four years, but when she was a young woman, she was so beautiful. When you see <laughs> you see her photo as a young woman. She looked like, even, you know, for an African girl, she looked like a mother. Very, very pretty. And she went on to have 12 children. 12 children. When we see her now, and we see the photo as a young woman, you know, you can tell us, like, who is, you know, who is this lady? I remember one day my big brother put my mother's photo on Facebook and people were like, I said, wow, who is this beautiful woman? That is my mother. Anything that is of great value and importance and significance requires sacrifice. Even you and I, God know that he, he, cut, he needed us. So he made you know, he sacrifices only begotten son to have us. If Jesus had not died, we would not be, you know, sitting down here calling ourselves Christians and children of God and be claiming the, the, you know, the promises of Abraham and all that. You see, anything that is of great value and worth calls for sacrifice. 
And in life, the thing is, if you don't sacrifice for something, you don't also value it or appreciate it. So the Bible tells us, uh, can, some, can we read um, uh, uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. I know now chaplain is in charge. So if the chaplain can display for us. I will try my best, sir. I'm driving. Oh, you're, oh no, no. If you're driving, then don't try. Uh, um, I think uh, we will engage, engage, you know, Sir Newton to handle this. If you're driving, please don't, I know, don't try this. Okay. So, um, can oh, yeah. someone read, read for us? Second Timothy uh, 2.19. Yeah, on, uh, yes. yes, sir. Uh, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God, which he has laid, stands sure and unshaken despite attacks. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the, names the name of the Lord stand apart from wickedness and withdraw from wrong, wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Now, in a large house, there are not only vessels and objects of gold and silver, but also vessels and objects of wood and of earthenware. And some are for honorable, noble, good use, and some for dishonorable, ignoble, common. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, which are dishonorable, disobedient, sinful, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart for special purpose, and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Good. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, alluded to the scripture because the Bible is saying that in a large house, there are so many vessels, some for honorable, for some for dishonorable. But it doesn't mean that both the honorable and the dishonorable, they are still not useful. With all due respect, there are, in every house, with all due respect, there is a toilet bowl. It may be for ignoble use, but it is what? It is useful. There's also the china ware that is there, which is for noble use, but they are all useful. So what I was making allusion here is this. In a large house, there are different vessels that are there. As the Bible may mention, some are from gold, some are from silver, some earthenware, some wood, and things like that. But it says if a man distinguishes himself, It doesn't talk now about the one that is made of gold, the one that is made of it, you know, because if they are not useful, why would the owner of that large house keep them? Then he will buy, fill his house like in Midas with things of gold in his house. Everything in the house of Midas was gold. He had a touch of gold. But he said that it is necessary that in that house they have vessels, some for honorable and some for dishonorable or ignoble Jews. So they are there. What is Apostle talking about? I'm talking about the fact that everybody in the God's house is useful for something. Never come to a place in your life that will devalue your wealth and settle for less. You may not have descended from royalty that is gold or silver, but you are useful for something. Because those vessels did not bring themselves to the house. Don't forget that. They have to be brought in from somewhere into the house. You were called in 
John says, 44, no one can come to me except the Father calls him. So don't come to be part of this and then the devil that will beat you with lies and, you know, satanic, you know, the contortions and distortions that you are not a candidate for the bliss and the blessings of life and marriage. You are. But one thing that sometimes goes against is that in this age, especially in the millennial generation, our propensity to want it and want it now and my way. It has to be my way or the highway. It has to be this way or nothing is going to work. I won't agree to it. You have to have what is called a malleable spirit. A spirit that is flexible, soft, and can bend. Marriage is not a competition, but this is a completing. You complete one another. You complement to complete. I repeat, marriage is not a competition that you come to complement to complete one another. The man brings fulfillment to the woman, the woman brings completion to the man. The question is, are you willing to sacrifice? Because all of you one day, especially for the young ladies, one day you will be mothers. But guess what? How are you going to have your children? Even if it is by immaculate conception, the children will be in your beautiful bodies. And then you start growing. And you start growing. And this beautiful shape that you have, you start growing. And then you deliver your beautiful babies, your sons and daughters, or twins, or triplets, or quadruplets, or quintuplets, or octuplets, whatever place that God will give. And then you have to go through the arduous challenge of dealing with the baby fat and all that. But then, you have to know that it's a sacrifice that is worth, that is worth the results. But then also you have to understand the sacrifice is needed not only for the bearing of the child or conception, but it should be part and parcel. You men, you young women, it should be what characterizes the union. If you are not ready to sacrifice pride and ego, and sometimes some of you, your home that will come from, maybe you are a Kennedy, maybe you are Obama, maybe you are, you know, from royalty, and your man or the woman is from nowhere, if you do not sacrifice that pride, you will not be able to get the result that you want. Let us see a book like The Songs of Solomon. I don't know how many of you have ever taken the time to read The, the, the Songs of Solomon. The Songs of Solomon is a strange book. The Songs of Solomon and, and Esther they are the only books in the Bible that doesn't have God's name in it. God's name is not mentioned in those two books. So someone said, if God's name is not mentioned, then what is the book got to do in the, with the Bible? It has everything to do with the Bible. Because if you read the Songs of Solomon, it's a love story between a powerful king who has it all, has it all. A powerful ruler, rich, handsome, has got everything. Who is madly in love with a shepherd girl, 
who even the brothers and the people, the neighbors, don't see her wealth or anything. That she is not presentable. They even mock her, laugh at her. But this king who has everything is so much in love with this girl that he will leave his kingdom to go and pursue her. And the lady is having attitude towards him. But the king still perceives her, write poems and say nice to every woman lies down. But the man perceives you and call you sweet, you know, they say sweet nothings, right? Yeah. Now you know what it means? It is between the love of Jesus and the church. That is what it symbolizes. The love. We, have we deserved this love? No. Nobody has deserved the love of Jesus. Nobody has deserved the love of God. And Jesus is that powerful, rich king who has it all. He will leave heaven and come down to earth for sinners like us. Working to get a bride without wrinkle or blemish. So that is what the Song of Solomon symbolizes. It doesn't have God's name. Everything is about romantic endearment between two lovers. And that is Jesus and his church. You and I. That Jesus had to sacrifice to end the church. The question is, what are you ready to sacrifice? Because it is easy. Hey, you can go to Vegas and marry in one second. And in one second, get divorced out there. I think uh, this girl, uh, Britney Spears, she went there, did some marriage, drive through marriage, and then within one hour, divorce. Have you heard anything like that? Somebody get married and within one hour gets a, gets a divorce. You see, you can do that. Those are the people who see the marriage license. They don't see its worth and value. They don't see the sacredness of it, but they see it as a receipt. It's not a commitment. But your job for you to be able to love and to love responsibly and to keep and to maintain it, sacrifices required. It may even happen. Yes, in most cases, one will come from a wealthy home, one will come from a poor home. In most cases, I've also said, all things being equal. And knowing that this is the will of God, the perfect will of God, because the thing is, you know, I go for, I will strongly insist on being equally yoked. On being equally yoked. I will never settle for less, anything short. Second Corinthians chapter 16, chapter six, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. That you are equally yoked. What is, why is Apostle very insistent? Because there is insurance guarantees in the future of that marriage. Insurance and assurance guarantees in the future of that marriage. So that you don't need someone to come in and say, oh, you know, our religion allows us to marry another woman. And then you come apostle pray for me. How am I going to pray to change his mind? The man is not a believer and you knew it when you were going in. So it is important that you are equally yoked. Because some people, certain cultural, certain religions, they do not value what the marriage certificate say. This was like a receipt. 
You don't want to be part of a harem. You know what I mean by harem, right? A harem is where some wealthy people, you know, gather a group of beautiful women and they take turns. You are not. You are better than that. So sacrifice is important. Examine yourself and check your, your habit and your behavior. If you are rude, if you are arrogant, if you are insolent, if you are apathy, those things must be sacrificed. And I don't have to come and preach repentance or change to you. Put yourself under the microscope and ask yourself, what do I need to change to keep this union? They say when you point a finger, all of you just, you know, I'm not seeing you here, but point a finger, just point your forefinger, right? You just point it in front of you like that. You are pointing the finger, right? Check how many fingers are pointing at you. You are pointing one finger forward, but check how many are pointing at you. Four are pointing at you. So when you point one finger, there are some pointing at you. Put yourself under the microscope and examine yourself. What do I need to do? Anytime there is some impasse, because in every union, get ready. You begin with initial friction. Whatever you call it, it's not major blowout. Because when you realize you're going, most guys, let me tell you, most guys are dirty. I'm not saying they are deliberately dirty. Their mothers help them to be like that. One day you'll be mothers of sons and you will know what it is. Mothers usually spoil your sons a lot. They'll get on their daughters more, but their sons, they will clean after them. So they grow up like that. Mommy will do it. You see, mommy will do that. You remove his shoes and socks and dress leave it somewhere in the sitting room and off he goes. Because he's been doing it throughout his life. It becomes second nature. And mom always comes to do it. Oh, Joe, don't do that anymore, please. <laughs> you know mothers. You know, and they go. But for you ladies, maybe they'll give you a lecture. You're a woman. You have to know that. They put down at the time your house and see this lying around like yeah, so uh, for the boys, you know, mothers will give them a pass. So most guys are like that, right? They grow up, you know, except those, they are exceptions that, you know, uh, but most guys are like that. You'll be lucky to have him maybe making the bed. He sleeps and then phew, get up. The bed is not done. He brushes up. You see him, you know, driving his nice car, but it's, his bed is not done. He use that, you know, the toothbrush and maybe leave it somewhere and off he goes. He's late to work. You see him, oh, handsome Mr. Johnson. As Mr. Johnson has left a dirty room and now off he goes. It is like that. So when you come into his life, you see these things. Immediately, friction comes. The devil starts sowing. I thought, I'm not here as your maid. I'm not here as your cleaner. I'm not here as your mother. I'm not here. I'm not saying sacrifice to do that. But mind your words. That you don't break bones. You don't break bones. Honey, you know, you know we have to share these things. Or maybe when you come to premarital counseling, drop a bag in my ears and I'll address it because I talk about all these things. The little, little fox of that spoil the vine. Don't go throwing, you know, shooting arrows, fiery darts, and certain fire that you cannot want, contain. Please. So, marriage. Marriage 
requires sacrifice. It's very, it's important. Mutual sacrifices. Mutual sacrifices. Because where this thing happens, when there's a sacrifice, you come to the place of selflessness. That to do things for each other with joyful delight, not by compulsion or coercion. Also, selfishness doesn't come in. But there are some people who are very, very, very selfish. And I pray that you are not one of them. If you do not sacrifice the spirit of selfishness, you, even Elijah, will come and pray for you. And you will not be able to, you know, bring fire down and your marriage will, will not succeed. You have to understand that you are marrying a man, marrying into a family of a man you don't even know. Maybe you met him at work, maybe you met him in church, maybe you met him at the bar stop, maybe you met him at a restaurant, or maybe, mm. you know, mm. and you don't know the person. But let me also tell you that the man is human. And Hippocrates says there are nine types of personalities. Other people say there are 21 different kinds of personalities. When that man comes, he comes with a family who have all these kinds of personalities. Some can come and rub you the wrong way, can be your mother-in-law, can be your father-in-law. Some are very blunt, some are abrasive, passive-aggressive. Some are melancholic. But if you do not sacrifice certain temperament, and someone even come and maybe offend you in a way, and you are not forgiven, and you want to, you will end up making a mess. We go to the movie, before the movie can be put something that is silent, silence is golden. Silence is golden. You don't put up a, a performance, but maybe when the cool of the day, when you and your husband are alone, alone, in your bed, in each other's arms, then you'll bring it out quietly, sweetheart. What did I do to your sister? She doesn't seem to like me. You saw what she did, right? Then you leave it. I'm sorry. My sister, is, you know, has always been that I'm going to, you know, take it up. Because it is the man who introduced the woman to the family. And it is the woman who introduced the children also to the family. Let me repeat it. It is the man who introduced the woman to the family. And it is the woman who introduced the children to the family. So some of these things use the power of pillow. You are together. Oh, it can also happen. Because I know some men who maybe marry somebody's princess and your husband, the father or the mother will never accept the man. Because you don't come from rich home or you don't have a, some name that ends with a Windsor at the end or Mount Barton, Windsor. You know, so they don't accept you. Or maybe it can be cross-cultural, pure cross-cultural reasons. People from different cultures. And they are because the thing is maybe you are married, especially in certain cultures that are very traditional minded. You know, people from here must marry people from here. You know, but in Christianity, it doesn't matter. The walls of division have been turned asunder, but not many people. They keep their culture, right? So no matter whatever you do, they will never accept you. They will always fight and they will always find something to say about it. 
It is not you going out there in order to you drop a back. What do I have to do? So maybe the woman will go home and say, Dad, Mom, I want to talk to you. I love this man. He is this, he is this, he is this. If you are not going to accept him for me, then I'm not going to come here or bring my husband here for you guys to disrespect him. They will sit up. Next time we'll go there, hey, Joe, hey, we love you, man. Hey, come sit here. Right? You didn't shoot an arrow. The battle is won. Sacrifice. Please, it is in a key and essential ingredient to everything in life. A businessman wants to start business. What does he start with? Capital. Money that is God saved up. He takes it. That's why all business people are hot. Entrepreneurs, they are big time gamblers. Because he's seen an opportunity. Jesus was even talking about the kingdom of God. Right? Someone who has seen a piece of land that has some jewelry goes and sell everything and come and buy it. Because you know that the future portends good with it. You know that your future will go work well with this man. Your future will be great with this woman. So you make the sacrifice. So put your life under the microscope. Examine yourself. What do I need to sacrifice? And stop this kind of this kind of talk because let me tell you this: marriage is always traditional. I'm repeating it. Marriage is always traditional. Marriage is at its best when it maintains its tradition, you know, traditional, you know, state. The man is the head and the woman, not the, you know, the dormant. Not the dormant. The woman is the help meet or helper suitable to the man, to the head. Because that is how God made it. And nobody can change the order of God or the arrangement of God. When you buy a car, you drive in a Toyota, do you take it to, to um, um, uh, VW, Volkswagen people to fix it for you? Because they are also a car mechanic shop. You take it to the shop where they have the tools, the, the, the parts and the expertise and the trained personnel to handle that vehicle for you. That is what marriage is. Marriage was made in the workshop of God. So we come to the workshop of God and that is the Bible. So examine yourself. Some of you are very unforgiving. You are always vindictive. You are like Shylock. You know Shakespeare's story, Shylock, the man who wanted his pound of flesh? If I don't put in my two senses, I can't even sleep. Come on. Come on. Your two senses, you poison the water. Because if you poison the water, like you were a fish, if that is where you live and sleep, you will spend eternity trying to apologize but you have given yourself away. The family will see you as a different person. And then they will, they will tolerate you, but they will not engage you. Because you have shown what? The true colors of your fairness. Am I making sense, people? Am I making sense? Or I'm just hyperventilating here. You're making sense? I'm making sense. Thank you. Thank you. Sacrifice is important. Examine yourself, people. And that is why you have to stay in the way so that you reflect everything. A person, you see, when, when Titus was speaking, he says, we should, in all things, we should display what? Integrity in the way. So that even those who hate us will be ashamed 
because they will not have anything bad to say about us. Hey, anything bad to say about us. Anything bad, because the thing is, if you display integrity in the world, and we're talking about young men and young women, young men and young women, if you show integrity in the world, then you put your enemies to shame because they will not find anything bad to say about you. You see? So marriage requires sacrifice. I remember when I was in Bible college and we were studying family life. And it seems it was very, very important because most pastors, you know, uh, I, I'm not saying it in a negative way. And I say, please don't construe me in the wrong way, right? Most pastors, sometimes, you know, if as a pastor, if your marriage is not great, right, it can affect your ministry. It can affect your ministry. When your wife is not happy, you know, and people see it, people can tell whether the woman is happy or not, whether the woman is loved or not, right? So in most cases, that becomes what? The cardinal barometer for people judging or the little gate, whether, you know, you, you are what you say you are. You know, so it was a key subject that, you know, the college president himself decided to teach because he says he doesn't want, you know, his students to go and then have married problems. Not sometimes because there are sometimes, unfortunately, and sadly, there are some you know, the, the moral issues that comes in, but sometimes too, because some pastors work so hard, and usually they don't have time for their spouses and even their family. Because, oh, I'm going to pray, sister, so and brother, so and so, the church, this church meeting, church. So it's like most pastors' wives, outing and things like that is, is out of the window. Vacation and things like that. They don't have it, you know, <laughs> because I think the pastor is working 24 seven. He's on call. So it's hard for, you know, things that regular people have and take for granted for a pastor to do that. Because if a pastor and his wife are on vacation, you can tell, you know, their, off, their absence is very much, you know, obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these things, sometimes it can create problems. So he decided to, to teach. And one of the things that he's, you know, he used to emphasize is this. And please, I, I think maybe I've mentioned it, I'll repeat, it's worth mentioning, that you, go, you enter into marriage, not for what you can get. And I want to just share this word of, word of wisdom with all of you. Not for what you can get. If you really, really know this is the man that God has for me, if you really, really know that this is the woman God has for me, you go in the marriage not for what you can get. You know, because in the world they have this theory of Prince Charming on a, on a, on a, on a white horse with a shining armor and that kind of stuff. And these days, there are so many people who are desperately out there looking for someone who's already made, you know, made his money. No. You go in for what you can give. I repeat, you enter into marriage for what you can give and not what you can get. You can only get what you give. 
So if you don't give nothing, do you get something? I don't know anybody who gets something for giving nothing. Even tithe in the Bible, right? God said, give your 10% and I'll open the windows of heaven and pour blessings on you. So if you don't give and somebody is giving his tithe, are you going to get the blessings of 10%? No, because you were in the position to do who did it. So you only get what you give. You can't go to the bank because it's a bank. Oh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. And then you go in there, yes, Mr. Well-dressed, Mr. Sewell's, Miss so-and-so. What I'm here to withdraw how much? 10,000. What's your bank account? I don't have it. What are you here for? Because it's a bank and there's money here. They'll call the police on you. They'll call the police on you. You have no business in the bank. You don't deposit. How do you withdraw? That is how life is. So this theory, like, you know, I'm looking for maybe a rich something. Um, um, I'm looking for this person in the place. If the man comes with me, it's fine. I'm not saying go there and make it to the street. If God is telling you, point is up, emphasize on the fact you must hear from God. The same. You know the person, is this is a God sent man for me, a God sent woman for me. And if it's God sent and you are very much sure that God has confirmed and affirmed it, and you want to roll with this gentleman or this lady, praise God. Then all these things are then you have to give it your all. I've also said so many times, it may happen that you may, the man may marry a woman who doesn't even have a job at all, or may not even have the education, or may not have certain credentials and things, but love is there. You know, Prince Harry now lives in Montecito. See, because of love, she left back in Ham Palace. And lives in Montecito, California, because of love. Now they want him to come back with his family. You see? So that is love. So it may happen that you may marry someone who is a nobody and comes, comes with nothing. But the thing is, you see not the now, but you see a great future. The both of you can build something better. The potential is in the future. You invest. The woman bring her all, you also bring your all, and then you invest your plan, you make, and then you create some business, and off you go. Jeff Bezos, you know, his ex-wife, you know, um, was very much instrumental in what Jeff Bezos was doing. So essentially, they build the, the, the you know Amazon together until maybe he fell foul, you know, and messed things up in a moral way with his friend's wife, and they they you know they divorce. You see, so you may not know the woman may not materially be bringing in it or the man. But the thing is, the potential for something great in the future is there. It's quite obvious. So it may happen that even the woman has better credentials or maybe make more than the man. But that should be the criteria or the yardstick. Primary. When you know that the man is hardworking, works out, is not someone who is just sitting down there, you know, and waiting to be wait, you know, sitting there to be waited on hand and foot, a couch potato. No, but a hardworking man because God expects the man to work and take care of his family. Genesis chapter three. By the sweat of his brow, take care of his family take off his business. 
So it is more about what I what I can give, not what you can take. And that has become the trend, unfortunate trend these days. Everybody's looking for some maybe some celebrity, some star, some whatever, and things like that. And with all due respect, trying to attract and going and, you know, Instagram and, you know, meeting people and sometimes random people. You don't even know them. If God is telling you to go there, praise God. But you have to do these things with a prayer because you may not know that God help you that you don't attract Jack the Ripper to your house. So sacrifice is a key requirement in a peaceful, loving, fulfilling, prosperous, successful marriage life. Sacrifice. People who are unwilling to sacrifice anything, and sacrifice shouldn't be like quid pro quo. Let me, maybe quid pro quo, some of you, it's like, you know, you did it, so me too, I'm doing it. No. You don't wait for someone to do something. You make the move where it is necessary. So that you can share the space. Your space will bring peace and joy and understanding. The mutual commitment of bond of the bond of love is very important. God shows us the example of sacrificing to get what you want. And we too must emulate that. Plus the fact that, you see, um, I think we read the earlier verses in Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> 21 to, to the end. And <clears throat> within that scope, we have to understand that if the marriage is not founded on certain values, then there is a kind of what? A detached commitment. And I think, let me put it this way, because the thing is, ladies, with all due respect, and gentlemen, with all due respect, when we're in a long-term relationship with someone, usually it can be, it can be long distance, but sometimes you don't need someone to tell you that the commitment is a bit kind of detached. That the way the phone calls come, maybe the way the conversation is maybe one person doing all the talking and the other one on the other is eh, eh, yo, e, 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 like that. How, how encouraging it is. It's just like <laughs> you even feel sorry for making the phone call. Or maybe you call, oh. Oh, let me call you right back. I'm on the other line. And 40 days and 40 nights, no phone call. You go, oh, it slipped my mind, you know, my job. Yeah, you work 24 7, right? You are the only person in America who works 24 7 and has nothing to show. But when the relationship is based on properly defined principles, biblical principles, and the commitment is deeply what? Mutually deeply what? Invested in each other. There are some things that comes just spontaneous. It comes just like that. 
Maybe you want to bake a cake to surprise your man. Or maybe you learned something, you saw something, and Martha still up cooking some beans with a different kind of ways. Oh, that means this dude is being still to surprise him for dinner. Let me do this, right? You don't even know how to cook, but suddenly you are learning how to cook because you know you don't want to eat outside anymore. You know, and then you start making sacrifices. And then you don't even want to get out of the house because you are so happy having each other and doing things together and going to Ikea and buying things and coming and not bringing anybody handyman or any brother or sister from the church to come and help you, both of you doing your own thing. You fix your bed and then you sleep on it and you are so happy, you feel cool. It's our bed. We bought it, we set it up. Hey, we are heroes. And maybe when the woman is due, you know, the man go out there, go buy his own. The lady will tell you, you go and buy the paint loads or where, where, Home Depot. You know, I want the baby room to have this color here. Yeah? The lady buys it and then you put it, you push the, the basket and then you come and then she will paint it this way, paint it this way. And then you are out there. Suddenly you are a painter. You don't even need, need Michael Angelo to come and paint the baby room for you. You are the woman's hero. That's my man. That's my man. And the baby is kicking in the mother's womb, cheering up. That is a cool painter. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. So sometimes there are certain things you have to want to sacrifice. You, you have to pray. And fast is also sacrifice. God, show me what to do. Or let me know what I need to do. And learn to also to say sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not some sorry that's in your face story. When you know you are wrong, just own it up. Don't bring unnecessary argument to justify something that you know that will cause a mess. And you are for that. So on this note, I'll pause here, maybe give room for one question. Amen. I know that at the end, when this thing is done, we'll have plenty of questions. Praise God. Amen. Has tonight been great? You guys love it. Hello. Is there? Holy. Yes. Mr. Thank Newton. You, okay. We see a sister, Abby. How many Abbeys do we have? Abby, is that your sister? Abby, stay me. Please. That's my, me. That's my uh, fiance, Apostle. Abby, oh. Abby, welcome. Abby, join Hi, us. thank you. Abby, join us from Hawaii. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for everything. All right. Praise God. So on this note, um, let us, you know, we'll call it a night. We also want to welcome our sister Esther. Abbas, we have a question. I have a question. Oh, uh, is that president? Doc? Yes. Oh, I thought you are not with us tonight. Okay, can we mess up? Okay, can we? That's the question, right? Everybody can read. Can we mess up the perfect will of God and not get it back? <laughs> Maybe have to get another plan. God has. I'm going. Maybe have not got another plan. God has not his original, or does he know? Can someone read it for me, please? I'm sorry. Can someone just read it for me? So I, suppose I guess the question is, can we mess up the perfect will of God and not get it back? Or maybe we have to get another plan that God has, not his original. 
or does God know that we or this person was going to mess up in the first place? So it probably wasn't his original plan. <laughs> well, thank you, Doc. Well, when you mess up God's original perfect will, grace is there, but let us see, like Esau and, and Jacob, right? Esau sold his birthright, wept and cried and things. Did he get it back? He got something, but it wasn't the original thing. Hello, you know the story of Esau and his twin brother Jacob, right? All of you. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, he sold his birthright. So later on, when his brother Jacob got it, he was crying, you know, that, you know, so Isaac blessed him with something, but it wasn't the original thing. So when God gives you a perfect, you know, his perfect will, and knowingly and consciously, you mess it up. God being gracious will give you something, but it may not be the, the perfect will. So if you talk of another plan, yeah, there, there, there may be another plan because there's also the permissive will that is there. Or can God can be gracious and give you something else, but not the original perfect. So it can be about marriage, for instance. Right? That God knows that this is the man for you, this is the woman for you. And then you do all kinds of things and maybe, you know, things blow up. And maybe the marriage, you know, goes south. It may, you know, it may happen that you may marry again, but not the person that God intended for you. And that woman has moved on. Someone must have come and marry the woman. So you may marry another person, but that person may not be the perfect will of God for you. And it happens all the time. The God can give you a very good woman or very good man, but your attitude and your behavior and your nagging can create so much problems and then this thing, you know, doesn't go anywhere. But then later on, you settle into a situation and you find yourself in a big, big bias remorse. Bias remorse that you wish you have kept what you have. But then that is it. There's no turning back, you can't reverse the clock. The person has moved on and maybe is being treated like a queen, you know? Let us see, let me, even I mentioned Prince Harry, right? His wife, Meghan Merkel, was married before to a, to a movie producer. And then they were divorced. She was living in Canada. Now she's married to a prince with two children. Do you think if the guys go back and say, hey, baby, can you come back? Will, do you think she'll come back? Hello, ladies. Now they call her Duchess. Duchess. You ladies on this platform, if you marry into royalty and were <laughs> assuming let me you put yourself in this lady's shoe, and they are calling you Duchess um, um, Esther or Victoria, will you come back? No. To a Joe nobody? No, you won't. You say, Joe, you know, for old time's sake, <laughs> I say, I'm sorry for you, but where I am, I can't come back. So when we talk of another plan, no. There is a plan. But God, that plan can be maybe a plan of a cushion arrangement. Maybe you have to get another plan God has, not his original. Yes. You can get another plan, but it will not give you the optimum satisfaction that the perfect plan will give to you. 
So you always leave with that bias remorse. And especially when it comes to love, when you person really, really, really love someone and you care for the person, and maybe you mess up and the thing, that doctor will never leave you. You will forever, ever grieve in your heart for that person. You see, or does he know we or this person were going to mess this up so that it wasn't his original plan? Well, we cannot say that. God knows everything. God knows everything. But we have to also understand, Doc, I know you are not the one asking this question. We have to understand that God Almighty will not violate our own personal choices. And that is why it may be based on this third, you know, you know, um, aspect of your question, right? That you have to walk in great discernment. Are you that convinced that this is from God and you are prayed and you know it's the will of God, the perfect will of God? Then you go in. You invest your time, talent, and treasure, everything to go and make it work. To go and make it work. So God will know that some people will mess up. You know, but the thing is, that is why we also have, you know, certain, you know, arrangements there that things should be done the Christian way, effective premarital counseling, and that, you know, the person remain in faith with you because if the person I mentioned about being unequally yoked, because if the person is not equally yoked with you, they turn it to your Christian upbringing, your Christian values, your Christian virtues, your Christian commitment, and your Christian faith, then it is difficult because the thing is, if you go for counseling, how is your pastor going to counsel you? The person doesn't belong, believe in, in God. I did counsel with a guy. He told me, point blank, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. He said he's a Satanist. And this sister who is a believer, I'm not kidding. This sister who is a believer has married this guy. And this guy mocked God. He said he's a Satanist. He told me in my face, I believe in Satan. I worship Satan. I don't believe in God, in your God. That's what I don't believe in your God. And he was standing me having an attitude. I said, well, Satan agent, I'm sorry. I don't have the Bible of Satan here to read it. I looked at the sister, I said, there's nothing I can do. You knew it going in as a Christian that you are not supposed to mess, mix with people like this. In my face, he told me. So it's all contingent to these things. It is the perfect will of God for everyone to marry and be happy in your marriage. It is the perfect will of God that you will succeed in a marriage, in your union. It's the perfect will of God that you will live, spend eternity together until death do you part. But sometimes too, there are certain moral choices and things like that, that you have to be very careful. For Adam, all his, his force, as I mentioned the other day, live with one woman for 930 days. May God bless you. I hope I've answered the question, Doc. Is the good doctor there? I'm here. I, I, I just hope you answered it for the one that asked. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, thank you. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't say you asked the question, right? So whoever asked the question, you know, I, I tend to over elaborate on things. So, you know, uh, it is my way of answering questions. So God bless you. Thank you, Doc, for joining us. I thought maybe you are busy at work. So I appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so very much, all of you. Um, I think when we, next, maybe next week, Doc, I think we'll have one more to go, right? And then, so um, 
maybe a week or two, I will open the floor for open forum for you to bring your questions. Thank you so, so very much. And God bless all of you. Now, um, for those that are here for the first time, Sister Abby from Hawaii and, and Esther, God bless you. Now, shall we ask Mrs. Doc, Mrs. Thompson to close us? Is she also at work? Oh, okay. Shall we pray? Our Father and our Lord, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for the words of wisdom that through the apostle of God you have given to all of us. We ask that your grace will guide us, oh God, will guard our hearts and our minds, oh God, to yield our, our spirit and our will, oh God, to your perfect plan and will for our life pertaining to marriage and family life, oh God. We pray that you will bless the apostle in Jesus' mighty name, that you will continue to strengthen him, oh God. I lift up everyone who joined, even those who couldn't tune in for one reason or the other. I pray that you will bless us, oh God, in Jesus' mighty name. Whatever the need is, oh God, you know, and you are able to do all things, oh God, according to the power, oh God, that works in you. We thank you that even as we go back, that you will protect us, oh God, you will cover us even as we sleep. Let us have sweet dreams, oh God. We bless and we glorify your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mrs. Samson. Now shall we share the grace together. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest Amen. be in a bar with us now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you so, so very much. Please keep spreading the word. Abby, welcome. And Esther as well. Welcome. Spread the word and invite more people to join us. You can also share.